there was a change in me at some point in my life where I stopped caring if people got what I did mm. and I realized that like the freedom of doing what I enjoy and doing it my way is so fulfilling and I also kind of like a part of me like kind of enjoys making people grossed out <laughs> my name is uh Beth I make music as do blonde I have Tourette syndrome so little jerks like this and I've got prolalia which is uh 10% of people with Tourette's have it and it's the swearing fuck off like that okay. and um yeah I'm a musician an animator I'm building a video game I do lots of have fingers in lots of pies of stuff that I barely taught myself to do but enjoy doing yeah well, you said something about being technologically rubbish earlier when we were talking about setup, which is obviously yeah. absolute nonsense, if you don't mind what? me saying, wow. because of all the stuff you do. Come on, what are you on about? I think that I, I'm a big believer in learning the bare minimum of what you need to know to make something work. Yeah. And I think it's great if you know more, but if you're like me, like I have ADHD, I'm not going to be able to focus on learning one subject and the depths of it for years. Yeah. Um, like I'm learning mixing at the moment, half of it I don't understand, but I know, fuck off. I know that if I turn this knob, it makes this thing happen. It's good enough for me. So yeah. in that sense, like talking about latency and how to stop the latency, I don't know. But we've always got YouTube. I only know that button's there. We're talking about the low latency monitoring mode in Logic. I only know yeah. because it was happening to me and I Googled it. That's how I've learned everything. I'm completely self-taught, so. Yeah, same. And I, what an amazing time that we live in that like I taught myself how to animate from fucking YouTube and Reddit and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, love the internet. The stuff you make is brilliant. I mean, yeah. it's just so, I don't know if you feel, that, obviously I don't know how you feel about your own work, but I think <laughs> there's a thread that runs throughout the whole thing, which is obviously you and, and you know, you're, you're changing you ness yeah. through the years but when I look back at like earlier videos that you directed and then more recent ones and some of your collaborations and stuff like, they're so out there and different and very <laughs> you I just love seeing someone being so themselves oh, I don't know if it feels like that to you but it looks like that to me that's you know? so lovely to hear and kind of, yes it it does I, I remember when I was a kid and I was really socially anxious I still am but like I you, I, you know it's like teenagers you're like going out to like uh, parties and raves and stuff and I just I just felt like I just felt embarrassed about myself all the time and then I remember and I never took his advice but it changed something in my brain and my brother was like just as soon as you as soon as you get there just do the most embarrassing thing you can do <laughs> and then everything else is fine and it's sort of like I was like fuck it yeah we're all gonna fucking die if uh People are like, oh God, I wouldn't do that. I'm like, well, I would. Well, that's why. That's why you're there. <laughs> yeah, that's my job. <laughs> isn't, I think about it about songs a lot. When someone really identifies with a song, often there's many reasons, but one of the reasons can be that the song sums up how how they feel or, or what they want to say, but they could never have put those words together. Yeah, and that's why people are like, oh, I, I would have said that if I'd had the words, kind of thing. Definitely, yeah. Maybe in videos as well. It's like you can be a version of, you know, what they could never be, but they'd like to be that brave kind of thing. Definitely. And also, like, similarly, uh, I mean, I got into animating by accident, but once I started animating, I was just like, I can draw any situation. So, like, things that, you know, if I want to be falling out of the sky and like landing dangerously on something yeah I don't have to pay if I can production company or like figure out the special effects I just make it a cartoon mm. but it mm -hmm. like opened up the possibilities of what I could get into music videos on like a very low budget yeah or well, low budget but surely high time budget because we all know how long it takes oh my god yes Oh my god! Because also I do I do cell animation, so I animate in the way that like Disney movies when we were kids were animated. So literally yeah. frame by frame is a, a new drawing. Yeah, yeah. So like, because I still get people like hitting me up for like music. Video. They're like, oh, okay. how much would it cost to get like a three minute music video? I'm like, well, it's seven months of my time with no like no weekends. <laughs> yeah, it's long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why have you done that to yourself? I don't know. <laughs> There's something about that, though. I really love the detail of things. I've always directed my own videos, edited them. I edit yeah. all the stuff and record things. And all. I did 50 episodes of a podcast and hand edited every single one. Of them. Yes. But I just like that. I like yeah. that detail and, and having my hands all over it. Yeah, totally. And it's very, I think things like that, 
when you get to the finished pro- product, it's so satisfying. Yeah. Because it took that long, almost. Yeah. And it also makes you appreciate everyone else's work a lot more as well, when you know, yeah. like, what goes into it. Yeah, and I'm always trying to tread the fine line between making sure that people who like my stuff sort of know that. Not because Mm -hmm. I need them to thank me more. I just mean like, I think it's useful to know because it's very easy to watch someone's finished product or listen to someone's finished product and go, I could never do that because it's so like, it sounds so perfect or professional or whatever. If you know Mm -hmm. that it's really just about layering this on top of that, on top of that, then it's accessible. Totally. This is why I, I talk a lot about how I do things because I, you know, I left school when I was 14. I never went to college or university or whatever Mm. and I taught myself everything like I said from like YouTube and Reddit and I never even would have considered that I could become an animator that wasn't an option that was like taught to me um anyone can if you can make a flip book with post-it notes you can be an animator Mm -hmm. and same with like music production same with releasing Mm -hmm. a record that's why I'm so vocal about like you don't need to have record label backing. You don't need to understand like how an interface works. Totally. Because a lot of the time when I talk about this stuff in the back of my brain, I'm like, I'm coming, fuck off, fuck off. I'm coming from like a privileged place in that I can afford to buy logic. I, yes. I can afford to buy an interface, a microphone, mm-hmm. etc. So it's like, it's always in the back of my brain where I'm just like, I can be like, anyone can do this. And then yeah. some kid who doesn't have a job and doesn't come from a wealthy family can't because they, they don't have access to this yeah but the two points I would make are there there are other ways to do stuff I made most of my first songs on a second-hand four-track recorder that I got mm-hmm. um and it's like it's not the best option out there but there are cheap and free options and yes. the other thing is that if this is your job these are expenses that would happen if you were starting a company if you needed to buy certain supplies for your plumbing job yeah things like this it's like things do cost money um but it's not there's a lot of other things that don't have to be like in your way absolutely you might think you need this particular microphone or this particular guitar or this particular pedal that's however much money. You absolutely don't need those things. But if you can afford them and you want them and it excites you and it makes you want to make yeah. something, that's cool. But you don't need that much stuff. Don't need, exactly. I totally yeah. agree. Some of my favorite songs are badly recorded. And my favorite part of the song is when someone goes out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> because it's human and it's real. Yes. And it's, it's It <laughs> creates like a human feeling in me yeah it's not an exam you're, you're like expressing something so yeah. if there's something to express I think it's valid so I just don't totally. buy into this you're good or you're bad or it's like when people yeah. show up on on normally Facebook to tell me how crap I am and why I'm just like <laughs> this is the thanks. other thing like <laughs> what what is I know that you know people review restaurants and shit but it's like what is it about being a musician especially someone I mean like I'm trans but like I'm very femme mm. presenting especially mm-hmm. a musician who people perceive as a woman f- that they will go out of their way even if they think they're not being nasty but to give you advice and you're like yeah, yeah. John who fucking works in an <laughs> office fuck off like i never know who they are they don't give any credentials do they they just like sort of swerve up in their online car tell me a bunch of stuff some guy actually uh, he he was telling me the other day this chap that i should sing more like celine dion (laughs) and i was like what do you mean and and then i said what do you mean because i was like what do you mean to say this to me really and he thought i meant i didn't understand so then he explained thoroughly what he meant which was that he wanted me to sing both more loudly and more quietly with more notes and I was like and then at the end of it he wrote hope that helps <gasps> oh my god it's like just listen to Celine Dion Jesus oh my fucking god I hate that yeah I don't know what it is about the unsolicited advice from people who don't have credentials do you think they sit there doing the rounds? This is what I've been thinking. Like, because I feel like I'm one of 20 comments that person made like in that hour. Yeah. Yes. And then, and then their, their partner and kids are like, dad, what are you doing in the corner looking angry? Yes. M- mashing your phone keypad. Like, what are you doing? So, Come and have dinner with us. 
<laughs> he's yes. like, no, I'm busy under the bridge. I'm, I'm busy like <laughs> doing good for the planet. I'm helping all these people with their terrible careers. I'm helping all these young women. <laughs> what would they do without me? Oh, it's astonishing. Beesh. Anyway, <clears throat> let's talk about your recording stuff. Yeah. What are your recording essentials? My recording essentials. Um, Shure SM7. Nice. Uh, with my glitter Paris Hilton sticker. Beautiful. I thought that. I thought just thought that was a sticker of you on there. Actually, yes. Well, like. you see, I gave one to a guy at a coffee cart, and I think he thought I was giving him a sticker of myself. Here's my face. So you can have it forever. Yes. No, it is Paris Hilton. I made the sticker. She's holding a hot oh. water bottle, and it says that's hot. But anyway, <laughs> that doesn't change the sound. I don't think. Um, okay. I used to have fuck off, a, like a a focus right solo. Yeah. interface mm -hmm. because i had a 4i4 with the four inputs and if i can gave it to my ex-boyfriend when i loved him gotta be careful with love and gear <laughs> and then when we broke up a couple of weeks later i was like oh fuck man like i've got to remove my guitar to put my bass in back and forth back and forth and then um finally my other one conked out yesterday it fell off the desk and just broke and then I was like I'm gonna get myself so I've got a 4i4 again nice. um so yeah sure sm7 focus right 4i4 I use logic pro um I have a guitar <laughs> did you know I'm glad because <laughs> there's a lot of guitar on your record yes <laughs> now I have a I have a guitar that um I got from this sounds boasty but it's more, it's just such a weird story that I think yeah. it's like a good, interesting story. Um, do you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yes. So you know Jeff, the manager, yeah. Jeff Garlin. Mm -hmm. He gave me this guitar. That's cool. Which, it was because I was at a show that my friend, uh, do you know Ezra Furman? I know of Ezra Furman's work. Yeah. yeah. So she was playing a show at Largo in LA and it was in it was at a comedy thing and it was in between Sarah Silverman and someone else and uh Jeff was like comparing yeah and i was fucking shitting myself because for a long time i had been in a relationship with this guy who was like a really heavy like weed smoker mm -hmm. gun fanatic and it was a very depressing time we spent a lot of time in his dark apartment eating chicken which is my song from one of my albums, Take Out Chicken, is about this. Anyway, okay. the only thing that lifted my spirits throughout the relationship was watching Cape Your Enthusiasm. Wow. And Jeff was my favorite character. So when I saw mm. him in real life, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then Ezra like mentioned to him that my guitar had just been stolen and I'd gone to LA to make a record and I couldn't afford to buy another one. Yeah. Um. And then he was just like, I'll get you one. And usually Aww. I would be like, God, no, that's like way too much. But then sort of like what my therapist would call my parent voice was just like, someone's offering you something and you do need it. Yeah. It's the most amazing guitar that I've ever met. <laughs> what kind of guitar is it? It's a Fender Strat. It's mm. hand wired. Um, it's red. <laughs> but there's just something about it where it's like you mm. touch it and it sounds beautiful amazing and it's yeah. funny because i i have like 16 electric guitars and before i found this one i was just like oh yeah they're all pretty good now i'm like you can just hear the difference and yeah. it's the fit because i used to be like doesn't matter don't get like a branded guitar like get whatever you want and it's like true it's like you can mm -hmm. make most things sound good mm -hmm. but this thing is like magical so that's like my like guitar forever now that's wonderful. i'm in love with it um yeah and then i just have a bass which i think is a and uh, I don't think it's a Fender Jazz. What's the other standard Fender bass? Precision? Yes, I think. Uh, they're my favorites. And that's it. I got super addicted to like buying guitar pedals mm. um, when I was with the the guy who's got my uh, interface. Mm. Um, and I bought so many guitar pedals and then eventually like I went on tour and I just took two and it mm. was, well, three. Tuner, it was like, a rip off of like a rat is it like overdrive yeah um and what's that brand can't remember just another overdrive my point being yeah these two combined one of them being like a 20 quid rip off of like a 200 pound pedal 
was exactly the sound I wanted. Yeah. And I didn't need anything else. And then I was like, God, I've literally spent fucking hundreds on these pedals that I don't use because I was indoctrinated into thinking that like it would make my music better. Right. Okay. Yeah. It didn't. But another thing is that with Homecoming, my last record, I recorded all, actually all of my music that I've made since Homecoming. Um, it's just Logic Pro plugins. I was going to ask it how you record your guitar. So do you plug straight into your interface or do you go through something else? No, I go straight into the interface. The one thing I'll say about Homecoming is that in the mixing process, so it was mixed by Sam Grant from Pigs, 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 Pigs. Yes. I have to count on my hands. Um, and he did reamp a lot of the guitars. So they do kind mm-hmm. of like sound sweeter, but it was based on my initial sound. Great. The uh, plugin I use pretty much for everything is Classic Drive. Mm. Every so often, if if I want like a slightly fatter, less like sharp sound, I'll turn off whatever the the left hand pedal is in the pedal board. Mm-hmm. That's it. Great. Yeah. There you go. That's all yeah. you need. Because it's not about that. It's about what you're doing on yeah. the guitar and what story you're telling in your song. Totally. And I think similarly to when I was to sing about like how you know every so often if someone sings out of tune on a record and I'm like whoop. And then I'm like, I love it. I want to ask you, please, about your space and how it influences or doesn't influence your creation of things, because it's very beautifully decorated. And I've only just recently realised the power for myself of having like nice coloured walls and like pretty lights and stuff. I just used to just chuck stuff in the corner and not care. So I'm a very visual person. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you were asking the question I was thinking about like my um journey from studio well originally bedroom to studios yeah back to bedrooms yes which was also on my list actually because you've yeah you've had experience of the posh way of recording as well haven't you totally well my favorite sounding record that I've done is homecoming and that's the one that I did with this mic that interface and it was in my mm-hmm. my childhood bedroom mm. But I, I think it has a real uh, a real influence over me. And just like, you know, someone might be more comfortable in a professional studio being like, you know, I feel like a professional and this is going to give me the professional juice I need. <laughs> Whereas like, I'm a very much like a homebody kind of person. Yeah. So being comfortable is super important. But I actually, I don't think I've realized the power of like, home decor until I got this place Mm. so at the beginning of the pandemic I came to stay with my mum in Newcastle I was living in London yeah and I came to stay for two weeks and then I've never gone back so that's three years ago and I I made homecoming at my mum's house and then I was like I need somewhere to go because in London I had a desk space that I went to go to fake work every day so Mm. that I didn't want to (laughs) die Yeah, okay. <laughs> and it worked and so here I was like okay so I was going to move out and this is like a basement apartment and then I was just so lonely so I moved back in with my mum but I was like it's going to be my studio mm. and then luckily like my landlord is super cool and I was like can I paint and she's like yeah go for it and I was like can I paint cow print she's like yeah whatever you like <laughs> like you know as long as I paint it white when I leave yeah um and then so suddenly I was just like I can make almost like my dream teenage bedroom yeah and it sort of almost looks like a music video set Mm. so it's like I walk into the place and I'm already in the brain space of the kind of stuff I want to be making Mm -hmm. um and it's just yeah it's made such a difference because it's such an expression of my self it kind of like resets my sense of self when I come in here um whereas like I find when I'm in big posh studios like I've always felt very out of place in like expensive places or Mm. professional like I don't like authority I was crazy lucky that the first producer I ever worked with was Ben Hillier Mm. um and he because he was the the first producer I worked with I thought he was the standard Mm. but he's not so he was he listened to all of my ideas. He translated all of my ideas. And he also told me how everything worked in a completely very simple, plain English, non-condescending way. And I mm. learned so much from him. But in a sense as well, then it gave me something to compare other people yeah. to. 
Yeah. Um, but yes, I've been told they were going to hire a piano player for a couple of grand. And I was like, well, I'd like to play the piano on my song. And the guy was just mm-hmm. like, well, can you even play piano? And I was like, yes, the piano on the demo is me. <laughs> Same with the guitars. I wasn't allowed to play guitar on my own records. Yeah. Yeah, I was once locked out of uh, mixing sessions until I was like, well, you can't release the album unless you oh my let God. me in. Yeah, it's fucking... It's, it's wild, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> who do you think you've signed then? Some yes. complete idiot. But you loved the stuff so much. You wanted to give them the deal and the money yeah. and the stuff. Yeah, but, and, yeah, yeah. but now you're like going to infantilize this person and replace them with other people. Totally. It's like I've been, I've been producing since I was 15. Mm. And then I signed to labels and then I wasn't allowed. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. My goodness me. I honestly, like, I don't like to think I've got any regrets in life because it's like I, where I'm at, I like my life. I'm happy with myself as a person. Yeah. And, you know, you like go go back and butterfly effect like something terrible might happen if you go. But I I wish I had never signed to labels. I wish I had stuck to producing my own stuff, making my own CDs and stuff. Yeah, I also think I'd be far better off financially as well. Probably. I'm really glad yeah. you've come out the other side of it, though, because I think so many people don't. I mean, they just they just lose heart. There were so many times where I either just didn't want to live or at the very least didn't want to make music anymore. Couldn't mm-hmm. make music anymore because the act of making music had been come so intrinsically intrin- bound to the trauma of trying to do it in this environment with yeah. those types of people that I just, it wasn't even in my heart to want to make a melody. It's so sad. It is sad and that it's not right for someone to take that from you because that's yours, you know. You know, when I first decided to self-release, it wasn't because I thought it was going to work. It was because it was my last option for making and releasing music without absolutely hating the fucking world. Yeah. Um, And I'd got to a point where I was just like, I would rather make a record that I make start to finish that is mine, that I love, that entirely flops, that I lose money on and everybody hates, than go this other way. Yeah. And it turned out to, so far, it's been the most successful record I've had. I've made the most money from it. I'm still really happy. And like people are still listening. Like I'm still getting royalties from it now. So Mm -hmm. then I'm like, but this was what I was told the whole time was just like, well, you can try and self-release, but you'll not sell anything. No one will listen to your music. Everyone will assume you're dropped, which is such a shameful thing to happen. It's like, oh you me. guys were fucking gaslighting me the whole time. It's almost like they wanted you to think that so that you wouldn't leave. Yes, yeah, so, so ah. that they could benefit from my hard work. Ah, strange that, isn't it? It, it? Well, I've started to like realize more and more both in the music business and also in toxic relationships Mm. is that usually people who are telling you that you can't do something without them have something to like benefit from you sticking with them yeah there's so many people who make it sound like it's really hard and that you definitely need their expertise because they've been in the industry 30 years but it's just like yeah but the industry has changed so much over the 30 years that your experience of like pressing vinyl in the 80s doesn't apply no you know there's probably some fucking 19 year old who's a genius at like soundcloud at tiktok who's gonna like blow you up just as much as some fucking six-year-old guy who used to work somewhere maybe these are the people who are leaving us the comments (laughs) do you think it's them they're like just bitter record execs it's like it's like all my old managers are like Steven seven five zero. I got this one today. I think it was today. Sorry, this was done twenty years ago. It's like, what? What? Did, what? Writing songs? Yes. I wrote back. I was like, it's still going though, isn't it? Writing yes. songs. What are you on about? Totally. What question did I ask? Because I don't care if people don't like my music. I don't need to know about no. it. Cause I'm not going to change it based on Jeff. 2785's yeah, comment. Yes. Because who would I be if I was going to change it? Yes, I totally agree. Where do you think your songs come from? I was thinking about this. Mm. Not to sound all hooey, but. I love a bit of hooey. Yeah, me too. 
I'm a witch. <laughs> so I really I really love the hooey. <laughs> yeah. But um either a formula that I've created <laughs> or sometimes I feel like my best songs I don't remember writing them. Mm. And I've seen other people talk about this as well. So like not to say that there's some mystical spiritual thing happening or it's but it feels sometimes like I'm channeling a song someone else wrote mm -hmm. and that gets shut out into my computer mm -hmm. um but often the songs that I end up loving the most that I think are my better songs I have really no recollection of figuring them out they just kind of mm. fell out whereas like other songs it's not that I don't like them but like I remember like I did this and then I was like oh I'll do this next thing and yeah that kind of thing um but I don't know if you experienced that ever yeah well and, and I've talked to people about it a lot so in, in my podcast that was a very common question and people talk about this idea of they might they use lots of different words like divination or um, channeling like you were saying all that kind yeah. of stuff sometimes it does feel like that because it feels like how could I possibly have done something so cool yeah. so easily <laughs> that's yeah. not possible I, I do sometimes think that you know songs might take 10 years really to to make but the it was like 9.9 .9 years of uh, my maths is terrible like nine <laughs> years of living and yeah. then a day of writing it or something but it's totally. all based on something from before so it's not like it came from nowhere and I don't know I don't know yeah definitely well it also makes me think of um some of my favorite songs I wrote in like 15 minutes and that yes. doesn't mean that it was finished in 15 minutes. I wrote it and then took a couple of days or a week or a couple of weeks or whatever to yeah. finesse it. But mm -hmm. like an example is, I'm glad that we broke up from Homecoming that mm -hmm. is a track I did with Ezra. Yeah. I wrote that probably in 10, 15 minutes before like, I think it was my last mixing session. And mm -hmm. it was a very throwaway, simple song. And it's got like the second highest streams, I think mm -hmm. from that record but it just sort of came out yeah I find that I get one or two sometimes three of those when, when I'm in the groove of groove horrible word zone yes when I'm in the zone so yeah. if, I, if I'm writing recording as I am at the moment I hope that you know three weeks in I'll just get an easy song and yes. that's probably because I'm in the mode the zone the groove yes. of doing it Totally. I have a real issue with like, I'll get seven tracks into writing a record and the seven mm. tracks were so easy. And then the last three to five, I just cannot do. It's mm. like whatever was working in my brain's shut off. And it's like, I can't get, and I think a lot of writers, all types of writers have this where you have like a couple of days to like a couple of months where you're like so productive. But then once the muse is gone, you can't just turn it on again you've just got to wait and I've had so many times in my life where I'm like it takes longer and longer like I don't write a song for like six seven months and I'm like oh my mm. god I'm never gonna write again yeah but it comes back yes and the thing is you and I both have a back catalogue so we we know that we've done it many times over yes so there's not really any excuse to go oh I don't know how I did it I'll never write a song again because you know that you will yes but I couldn't explain how necessarily yeah same with heartbreak. I've been so heartbroken so many times and every time being like, I will never love again. Yeah. <laughs> that now I'm like, oh yeah, no, I definitely will. Mm. It's fine. Yeah. It's I all think the same. that yeah, it just comes with age. Yeah. Yeah. Age, wisdom, awesomeness. Yeah. It just it just gets more and more over time, I find. <laughs> I think it yeah, I'm I'm much happier the older I get, the happier I am with life, which is really mm. nice because I thought it would go the other way. I really <laughs> yeah I hoped it would go this way when I was in my late teens I was obsessed with being in my 30s because all the cool women I liked who were making yes. music were in their 30s like PJ Harvey and it's such a know, fucking great age yeah very cool I remember it well <laughs> yeah I was so worried about like turning 30 mm. and then the moment I turned 30 it's like this thing washed over me where it was mm. like a piece and I was like, also a lot of it, the older I get, the less you get catcalled and like groped, which is a real privilege about getting older. Yes. Um, you just sort of become invisible in a very lovely way. Yeah, um, I enjoy that a lot. Yeah, but I was like, ah, I am I no longer have the chance to, um, to do everything I wanted to do in my 20s because I'm not in my 20s, but it just took the pressure off. Yeah. It's like now yeah, I've yeah. got the rest of my life to do it. 
I turned 42 last week, right? And I am. You'd look so, so much happy. younger than 42. Thanks. I moisturise. I've, I've started the skincare routine. <laughs> it works, honestly. Yeah. Um, but it's good because, like, I, I read this book. I can't remember what the book is called, but sort of the concept of a fuck budget and, like, how many fucks do I have available for things? <laughs> and so I, I was like, what is a fuck budget? <laughs> that sounds like it could be very sexy, but yes. it's the, the non sexy version of that, which is just. <laughs> Do I have any fucks available for this situation? Yes. No, I do not. And so I just I, I just that. go very quickly to to no fucks now. I love that so much. It's it sort of reminds me of a um a book that I bought from the Jeffrey Museum in London. I bought it because of the title, which was How to Date Buildings. And I <laughs> for ages I thought it <laughs> and like I was like, what are these people into? <laughs> But it was literally like, if the door is on the left-hand side and the window is here, it was made in 1709. That took me ages to get. Me too. Wow. Yeah, I love, yeah, I love stuff like that. Finally then, yeah. what tips would you give to someone who's finding it hard to give themselves time to be creative at the moment? That's a hard one because I, I don't know if I know the answer. It's really difficult because occasionally I've had to get a real job making mm. music is a real job but you yes. know what I mean working in a cafe yeah, of course. um and I when I've worked in cafes I've tried to do it where it's like four days a week mm-hmm. so I've got like enough for rent or whatever but I can still make music and I'm so tired mm. by the end but I find that when I'm stressed about not getting stuff done or not having enough time to do certain things if I kind of not forgive myself but if I stop being annoyed at myself it's easier for those things to come out because it's almost like I'm like I've got to try really hard because this is the only time that I have but it's the trying that becomes the barrier to like good ideas because you've got your critical brain on and I think that which is why a lot of creative people work really well at night is because naturally Mm. like your critical brain starts to go to bed and then that's when you come out with this like fucking weird guitar line that is the most interesting thing you've done um so I think it's sort of I guess like practicing um not not trying too hard which is very difficult yeah just just don't give any fucks just stop stop caring (laughs) easy done put the fucks in the bin (laughs) in the bin yeah totally and I think as well another thing which it's not necessarily a time-based thing um but I've I always struggle to finish songs when I get too caught up in what I think people are going to think about them which like my logical brain is like I actually genuinely don't think that but there's a part of my like emotional brain if there is one Mm. is always foreseeing you know that that's me being a 16 year old reading my fucking youtube comments of grown men being like is it a boy like what's this oh um God. and so it's like that's that's made some little pathways in my brain that are still there and i think that yeah. the the best time i have creatively is when i tell myself that what i'm making doesn't have to ever see the light of day yeah and i can turn off like the the external judgments that's really smart because it doesn't have to no and that's the thing. Every song that someone writes doesn't have to be released. Every yeah. painting someone makes doesn't have to go on Instagram. You don't have to feed these algorithms. Just do it for yourself. That's what it's for. The other thing I'm realizing recently is every song doesn't need to be a single. Mm, there is so yeah. much space on records for non-single songs. And I don't even necessarily mean like filler, but like songs that you naturally aren't going to be picked up by radio naturally aren't going to be the favorite songs but they're going to be yeah. someone's favorite yeah and they're just as important as the other ones and like everything doesn't have to be like a total flashy banger no. like the music I'm making at the moment it's taken me it's like the baby forever EP it's all my sad bummer music and it's taken me ages to finish because like part of me is just like well who's going to want to listen to this and then I'm like I listen to like sad core drony fucking depressing music most of the time so someone there's other people like me who want that (laughs) of course yes so now i'm just gonna gonna do it and i'm not calling it an ep i'm calling it a mixtape and by calling it a mixtape none of it has to make sense perfect but the thing is really it doesn't have to anyway does it no one of the freeing things about not being part of this industry of grossness is that (laughs) you do just decide what the fuck you want to do whatever you want to do 
my grandma used to always say, um, you can't please everybody, so please yourself. Yes. I was like, yeah, because like I'm going to, I can make an album that I've made because I think people will like it because they wouldn't have liked the other thing. But then there's still going to be a whole group of people who don't like that. Yeah. Jeff's always there, ready to tell you. Yes, he is. (laughs) Waiting on his pedestal. Looking down. (laughs) Hope that helps. Yes. (laughs) Let me know if you want more. (laughs) I've had a wonderful time talking to you. I hope this is the only time we ever talk because you're great. No, I'm sure that it won't be. (laughs) I'll start a podcast and then I'll interview you. Do that. Um, Tell people, please, how they can best support you and your music and your art and your wonderfulness. To be honest, at the moment, I've realized streaming streaming my music which is I think for a lot of artists they're like you get nothing from streaming but actually I get a pretty decent amount from streaming now that I don't have a label sucking up all my money nice okay and before I never really saw how it equates but now I do like that's if you're already praying for a streaming service and it doesn't Mm -hmm. pay you extra and you like my music that really helps um I have a patreon as well you have a patreon I have yeah I have a homemade one because I'm yes. weird. Um, tell us about your Patreon then. It's just do blonde on Patreon, but I do like a lot mm-hmm. of um, like studio updates, behind the scenes stuff, Q and A's. Mm-hmm. You can also homecoming onwards, download all of my music for free, get all of my zines that I've made in like PDF form for free. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a really nice community as well. It's just like that's where I go to be like, here's the process of me writing this song, and like, what do you guys think? And it's not the patronizing people. And it's just kind of like, I didn't expect it to be such a place where I felt like everyone was like, actually like my friend. Yeah. I love it. That's a really lovely side effect of it. I've experienced that as well. Yeah. I avoided Patreon for, not because I thought it was bad, because I thought it wasn't for me. Like, I don't think I really Mm -hmm. understood it for a long time. And it's incredible. And it's made me almost like feel like less um, lonely in the studio. Mm. Yeah. That's lovely. Yes. We'll do all those things, people watching, and um, I'll see you on Instagram sometime, do blonde. Yeah, bye. Thank you so much. (laughs)